Thanks very much. So now let's move to the political dimension for our first keynote speech. We are very privileged to be joined by Arthur Van Dyke. He's the King's Commissioner for the province of North Holland. That's the province that we are in at the moment in Amsterdam. He chairs the Provincial Council, the 55 people's representatives who are in charge of this province's policies. Commissioner Van Dyke. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Of course, at first, I warm welcome WLPG here in Amsterdam in the Netherlands. I think we really appreciate that you choose Amsterdam this year. So it's a really a great honor for us to, to host this Congress. And as I was informed, some of you already had a dinner last night and you made a field trip. And to talk about energy transition, probably it was an electrical powered boat. So the energy transition still is going on and it's on its way also here in Amsterdam. Ladies and gentlemen, the most recent Elfstedentocht was contested in 1997. For those who you are unfam unfamiliar with the event, the Elfstedentocht, which translates as the Tour of 11 Towns, is a long distance speed skating race nearly 200 kilometers long contested on natural ice, which, which passes through 11 towns in the northern province of Friesland, Frisia. The first edition of this race was contested in 1909. In order to, for the race to be able to be held, we must have a long and very cold winter with continuous sub-zero temperatures. There are those who believe that we will never have another Elfstedentocht due to climate change and global warming. By now, most people seem to agree that our planet has been getting warmer since around the year 1900. Most people also seem to agree that carbon dioxide is playing a part in this process. But as you probably know, we also have a challenge with nitrogen at the moment in the Netherlands. And fewer and fewer people are now denying that humans have made a significant contribution to global warming and to carbon dioxide emissions since the year 1950. So the main question that needs answered is obviously, how do we solve this problem? And is there any way it can be solved? And this obvious answer is to look at how we get our power. Given the current levels, levels of global warming, carbon emissions, pollution, fossil fuel depletion and modern geopolitics, it seems sensible, if not outright necessary, to focus on fossil, non-fossil energy sources, which means focusing on the transition to different types of energy. In so doing, we must be as matter of fact as possible in devising measures designed to reduce our carbon emissions. And the major advantage of solar and wind energy is that they hardly emit any carbon dioxide. But there is a chance too, in that the energy density of solar energy, wind energy and biomass is minimal. In other words, you need a lot of room to be able to generate significant energy which is why people are exploring the possibility of doing it in deserts, for example. Thankfully, as far as the energy transition is concerned, we are seeing science develop at a rapid pace, especially in the most recent years, and our outstanding of the subject is rapidly increasing as well. So the same thing is true for our knowledge of nuclear power in the development of thorium-based power plants, which are much safer and generate much less radiative waste than previous generation nuclear power plants in the past. Anyhow, on today's theme now, an energy in transition. It's a highly top topical subject, which will be continued to be topical for many more years to come. Obviously, a transition to different sources of energy with a view to reducing carbon emissions is something that will require an international approach. Since there is no such thing as a world government, we have no choice to rely on international collaboration and the commitments entered into by the various countries. It seems safe to assume that Western de democracies will be doing much of the heavy lifting in this respect. In other words, here too, there is work to be done. And the Netherlands won't be the Netherlands if we weren't to devote itself to this. 
We are a progressive country after all. And our Minister of Foreign Trade and Development Cooperation, Sigrid Kaag, and Eric Wiebes, the Minister of Economic Affairs and Climate Policy, call this effort climate diplomacy. It's not a net bad name, really. After all, there is some missionary work to be done. Not to convert people to a religious belief, but to ensure that future generations will be able to enjoy good lives and prosperity. Two weeks ago, the aforementioned ministers updated the Dutch lower house on a how climate diplomacy is being used and what progress is being made. And the Dutch cabinet has intensified its climate diplomacy efforts with both EU member states and other countries so as to encourage these countries to be more ambitious and proactive in implementing measures to address climate change. There is a group of ambitious countries in the EU who seek to attain more ambitious climate targets. This group, who consists of Denmark, Finland, France, Luxembourg, the Netherlands, Portugal, Slovenia and Sweden, is seeking to have a treaty calling for climate neutrality by the year of 2050, ratified as soon as possible. Furthermore, the Netherlands had advocated that the EU used to foreign policy to get climate change higher on various country agendas. In short, climate change is a global problem, but obviously there has been many international, national and regional initiatives to mitigate its effects. The EU has come up with some good international initiatives. Two weeks ago, it was announced that the Dutch politician Frans Timmermans, as European Commissioner, will coordinate the Green Deal, which is designed to make Europe a role model in the field of climate policy. I don't think it's strange that people look to the Netherlands for inspiration with these types of initiatives. Our history, and particularly our experience of managing the water that might otherwise engulf us, has resulted in an expertise in hydraulic engineering that is highly valued abroad as well as locally. In addition, it has turned us into pragmatic people who all are aware of the necessity of mutual consultation, collaboration and consensus. This attitude not only gave us water boards and our wide range of organization, it also raised in our oft-praised polder model, which is to say our devotion to seeking to arrive at a consensus, both in politics and in society. And this lack of scuffling is beneficial to economic growth. In 1997, Bill Clinton showered praise on our polder model. Of course, the economy was booming at that time. And it should be noted that the Dutch knowledge of hydraulic engineering is providing useful even today. You see, the Dutch approach to deltas is regarded as a blueprint for vulnerable coastal areas. And we'll soon have to step up our efforts to protect vulnerable areas all over the world, extreme weather caused by climate change. And this is the conclusion drawn in the flagship report by the Global Commission on Adaption, which was released recently. Scientists expect the amount of damage caused by inundation, heat, drought and flooding to increase even further if we fail to invest in measures that will prevent damage due to climate change. For instance, we will have to strengthen the resilience of coastal areas and future-proof our cities and agricultural land so as to be able to deal with extreme water. And weather, of course. All right, that's it. I will now leave aside global problems and focus instead on solutions that are, for the time being, local. After all, what works in one place may very well be effective in other places too. And under the Dutch Climate Treaty, the Netherlands has committed to reduce its carbon emissions by 49% from the 1990 level by the year 2030. And all types of industry, the manufacturing industry, the built environment, agriculture and transport will have to pitch in if we are to achieve this target. And this is where the aforementioned polder model, which is to say consensus-based decision-making, comes in handy. It was partly why we were able to draw up the Dutch Climate Treaty. It involved in a typically Dutch negotiation procedure 
in which all sectors, interest groups, companies, etc., got together to discuss this and enter into commitments, including provincial and municipal, municipal authorities. The treaty is expected to be signed by all parties involved in November. And just like before, this episode Dutch process of negotiation is being followed by other countries with great interest. All sectors have committed to make changes. For instance, this is what our government wants the transport sector to achieve. An ability to transport everything and everyone without worries by 2050. No carbon emissions, outstanding access to all places for people young and old, rich and poor, able-bodied and disabled. Affordable, safe, comfortable, easy and healthy. Clever, sustainable, compact cities where people and goods can be transported without a hitch. Beautiful, livable and easily accessible rural areas and villages where proper transport is the link between private lives, work and leisure activities. This is quite an ambitious goal, which the government hopes to attain by promoting an integral approach to the transport transportation system, in which all means of transport and all available infrastructure will be developed and utilized to the best of our ability, and in which all means of transport will eventually be green. And I know what I say, because in my former function, I was chairman of the Dutch Association of Transport and Logistics. And instead of being advocating our own interests, we really changed our goal in being a partner of the government. And that's why this treaty, I really assure this treaty will, be in, in, uh, will, be, will, will work. And in this way, we will not only honor our commitments under the 215 Paris Agreement, but also make a significant contribution to the re reduction of other types of env environmental damage. And as I mentioned earlier, the provincial and municipal authorities were also involved in the Dutch Climate Treaty. And they will ensure that 35 terawatt hours worth of renewable energy is generated by 2030. And this means that they will have to find room for solar and wind energy on their own land. Municipal governments are drawing up plans for a transition in the heating and cooling of spaces to ensure that the built environment no longer relies on natural gas. And the idea is to completely stop using natural gas by 2050. As mentioned before, the guiding principle of the Dutch Climate Treaty is to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 49% from the 1990 level by the year 2030. This will require an energy transition, which is to say a transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. In other words, to generate electricity, we will switch from coal and gas to wind and solar power, and in the long run, hydrogen power. And to heat our homes, we will switch from gas to geothermal heating, waste heat industry, or all electric. And for transport, it will involve a transition from petrol and diesel or LPG to electric vehicles or in the long run, hydrogen, biofuels, etc. So the, in, the energy transition is a major operation that will require a great effort and a large financial outlay from many parties. It's one of the main challenges the Netherlands will face in the coming years. On the one hand, we will focus on getting more electric vehicles on the road. On the other hand, we will also focus on the development of biofuels like Biogas. And it is the latter development that may present LPG companies with a few opportunities. LPG is a fossil fuel that may be phased out due to energy transition, which means the industry faces an uncertain future. LPG companies could try to change tech and focus on producing biofuels instead. In the Netherlands, LPG consumption has been decreased for years among several reasons due to higher excise duties and incentives to use electrical vehicles. However, on the global level, LPG consumption is actually on the rise. Since it's relatively clean type of fuel, with emits less carbon uh, dioxide than petrol or diesel, and because it's easy to transport, to transport and store. Some people consider LPG as a transition fuel. 
Transition fuels are types of fuel that may help us significantly reduce carbon emissions in the short term. And it may help us transition to other greener fuels in the longer term. The same idea of transition can also be seen in the way we use gas. Here in the Netherlands, we have recently become keen to stop using gas while other countries around us actually switching from other fuels such as coal to gas. We will see a lot of that during the transition process. Different people having different views, changing views, innovations, unexpected developments, advances in knowledge and lessons learned. In short, the goals we are working towards may change quite a bit by 2050. We must be able to respond to such changes. This being the case, the models we use should not be dogmatic. They should be realistic panoramas of a distant future, which must be able to be adjusted for the latest development and scientific insights. After all, we are dealing with things that are uncertain. Developments on the national and global levels are not entirely predictable. And this may raise the following questions, among, of course, many others. Do European and national energy and climate policies provide investors with significant certainty? And how will the prices of fossil fuels and renewable energy develop in the coming years? Which will become the dominant technologies? Many technologies are not yet fully developed. Moreover, innovation may result in new technologies. Uncertainty trends to make investors nervous. And how will public support for certain technologies develop in the next few years? We seek to make the province of North Holland energy neutral by 2050. This is to say we seek to bring about a situation in which energy consumption is more or less in line with the amount of renewable energy generated, thus eliminating the needs of fossil fuels, of course. Energy neutrality will result in a significant reduction in carbon emissions. And just to give you an idea what we are doing, at present, 5.7% of North Holland's power is generated by renewable sources. Onshore wind power is the fastest growing source of renewable energy. But for the time being, renewable energy is more expensive than fossil fuels. And without government sub subsidies, it's not profitable. Based on scientific research on the various sectors requiring energy, we expect North Holland's demand for energy to be somewhere between 160 petajoules and 200 petajoules by 2050. In our province, the following sources of renewable energy are important. Geothermal heat pumps and ambient heat, wind power, solar power, of course solar panels and solar collectors, biomass, and biogas, and that can be upgraded to green gas. Other technologies such as osmosis or seaweed farming are too cost inefficient for the time being, or are too far removed from the market to be usable. In short, the road is long and we don't have much time. And the English poet William Blake wrote in 1790, energy is eternal delight. Of course, Blake was referring to human energy but the words also apply to energy transition we are currently facing. If the world manages to meet the challenge heat on and successfully, our renewable energy may give us eternal delight as well. Thinking outside the box, being creative, launching new and different ideas, this is what our ambition to bring about climate neutrality by the year 2050 is all about. And this is true for LPG companies and it's true for all types of industry and for all parties involved in the energy transition which is both an interesting and incredibly complicated challenge and I wish you as a WLPG forum all the best of luck in bringing it together and about. Thank you very much and I wish you a very wonderful congress this week. Thank you. Thank you very much Commissioner Van Dijk. As the Commissioner mentioned, of course, we have that European Green Deal expected by February, and that's going to be a big game changer potentially for the EU, particularly in getting it to its net neutrality by 2050 goal. And this is why the timing of this event is so important, because that policy is being created as we speak. And so it's really important for all energy stakeholders to get in there early on with the Commission when it takes office 
on November 1st. And I'm sure this Green New Deal topic, Green Deal topic, is going to be coming up a lot during this whole day, but in particular, in our first panel, which is coming up right after the coffee break, where we're gonna be talking about these political issues in the energy transition. So, now we have our first coffee break. We'll be back here in the room at 10.15 for our Energy in Transition panel. I'll see you then. <laughs>